John in the New Testament says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. So the first commandment, I'm the Lord your God, you will have no other gods besides me or before me. And John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Shows that it's a problem in every generation. Well, what is it exactly? What does idolatry mean? That you have a skip bobblehead? Is that idolatry? No, I don't, I don't think so. Idolatry means you place something in the place of God. That's what it means. That's the easiest way to think of it. Idolatry is letting anyone or anything occupy the supreme rightful place that only God should occupy. Go back one chapter, chapter 11. Look at verse 35. This is God speaking to Jeroboam by some means. God says to him, but I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands. That's Rehoboam, son of Solomon. And give it to you, ten tribes. So God says, I'm going to give it to you. This is my gift to you. And to his son, I will give one tribe. That's Judah. Later on becomes two tribes. That my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. And so I will take you. And you shall reign over all your heart desires. You shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, now watch this, if, if you heed all that I command you, if you listen and you do what I say, if you walk in my ways, do what is right in my sight, keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. How's that for a promise? How's that for a blank check? Hey, I'm God, and I'm giving you a kingdom free. Here's the check. Go cash it. You know, it's funny. If you were to come up to me and ask me to write you a check for a million dollars, I'd do it. Your problem would be when you go to the bank. I'd happy to write you a check. If you want one afterwards, I'll write you a check. But when you go to the bank, they're going to laugh at that and go, there's nothing to back it up. Insufficient funds, that's what it'll read on the computer. Now, I know people who could write you a check for a million dollars, and they have the money and more in the bank. God gives to Jeroboam a promise of an enduring kingdom. What was his failure? He didn't take it to the bank. He didn't cash the check. He didn't, he didn't trust the promise that God gave him. You can always tell how mature or immature uh, a Christian is by how they treat the promises of God. Ask a person, what do you do with God's promise in the Bible? And if their best answer is, I underline it in yellow, you know you've got a problem. If their answer is, I take them to the bank, then you know you've got something. A fearful, nervous believer filled with anxiety speaks volumes. They don't believe the promises of God. A person who is calm and confident, that person also speaks volumes. I'm taking God's promise to the bank. Psalm 20, David writes, Some trust, trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Jeremiah 17, verse 5, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes the flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Jeroboam's heart departed from the Lord, and it is shown by his failure to trust God's promise, which begs a question. If he failed to trust God's promise, what did he trust in? That takes us to his third mistake. He feared losing power. He failed trusting God. His third mistake, he followed his own heart. Look at verse 26. Then Jeroboam said what? In his, you got your Bible open, right? He said in his heart. Jeroboam said in his heart. Stop right there. Here's a guy mulling it over in his own heart, in his own mind, thinking about what he wants to do. Just, it's all inward. So, he th said in his heart. Then go down to verse 28. 
Therefore, the king asked advice. Before he made the two calves, he's asking people. So he takes it out of his head, out of his little heart. He's kind of thinking what to do. Now he takes it and he asks advice. Not of the best people because he makes two golden calves. So he, he takes it out to them. Go down to verse 33. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel. On the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month which he had, watch this, devised in his own heart. Listen, Jeroboam was doing whatever felt good to him instead of what God said was good for him. You see the difference? How many times have you heard people say, well, you got to follow your heart. You just got to do whatever is in your heart to do. Can I just say that's bad advice? It's always bad advice. Why is it bad advice? Jeremiah 17, 9 declares, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Doing what is in people's heart is what has caused all of the problems in this world. Everybody feels something different, does something different. There's clashes and wars and I want this and the other person wants that. It just means a person does what he wants to do. The human heart needs to be steered by the divine will. My heart needs his head, his headship, his direction. One of our favorite verses of scripture, you probably memorize it within the first month that you were a believer. Proverbs chapter three, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Well, this is special, especially true in the area of worship because effectively Jeroboam changed the whole system of worship for the nation of Israel. And one of the most insidious ideas in the world is that we can worship God as we see fit. Because the only worship God accepts is the worship that God directs. God has told us who he is and God has told us how he is to be responded to. And God has told us how he is to be worshiped. That's why he said, I'm the Lord your God, no other gods before me, no images, etc." He spelled it all out. The worship that God accepts is the worship that God directs. So he made three mistakes so far. He feared losing power. He failed trusting God. He followed his own heart. And he did a fourth, which always must follow the third. If you're already doing the third, you're going to do the fourth. And that is he forsook God's word. That is, God laid out what he wanted, how to be responded to, and he forsook it. He goes from divine revelation to human imagination. He makes it all up. Notice, he changes the object of worship. Verse 28, therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. Does that sound familiar? Have you heard that before? You know what that sounds like to me? Exodus 32, guy by the name of Aaron. When Moses was up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments and he comes down, there's this golden calf. And Aaron said, this is the God, O Israel, that delivered you out of the land of Egypt. Same thing. Does the same thing. He moves from worshiping the invisible God, changes the object of worship to two golden calves, one in the middle of the country and one in the north of the country. Now here is always the problem with making an image of any kind in worship of God. There is no image that could ever be made that truly reflects the personality and glory of God. Can't do it. There can't, can't be done. As soon as you cast some image to remind you of some capability or some attribute of God, it only shows you that one, not the others. So why a calf? Why, why this? Well, in Egypt, they had worshipped Apis the bull, the calf god, which was a symbol of strength. So when they did that in Exodus and they did it again, the idea of a calf is that when you look at it, it would remind you of splendor and strength. You say, well, what's wrong with that? If when I look at an image and I'm reminded of God's strength, what's wrong with that? Here's what's wrong with that. It tells you nothing of God's love, God's forgiveness, God's forbearance, God's acceptance. All the other moral attributes are hidden 
by an image. So an image of any, there's no artist alive that can capture God. So God just says, don't do it. Isaiah 40, to whom will you liken God? It's a good question. What are you going to liken him to? Him to? Or what likeness will you compare to him? Answer, none. So he changes the object of worship. Notice also he changes the place of worship. Verse 29, he sets one up in Bethel and one in Dan. So the middle of the country, way up north. Instead of going to Jerusalem, the temple, there's two new worship places. Why does he do it? It's convenient. That's all. It's just easier. It's just easier. You don't have to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You can stay home right here, which is interesting. You know, instead of asking, is it right? He asks, is it easy? I'll do what's easy instead of what's right. Was the fall literal? Did it really happen? See, some people will say the book of Genesis isn't a literal story. It's allegorical. What say you? Well, when it comes to Adam and Eve, absolutely there was an Adam and there was an Eve, the two people. And I mean, even in Romans chapter 5, you know, Paul makes the contrast as by one man sin entered the world, so by another man, namely Jesus, you know, man was reconciled to God. So uh, there's absolutely no doubt. One of my heartbreaks is the fact that Christians, and I take their word for it that they are Christians, they are teaching today that Adam and Eve were part of the evolutionary process. Mm. You know, that they also evolved and then God eventually put a spirit in them. Uh, first of all, evolution, you know, that's, that's a whole separate uh, problem. I mean, it's something like believing that there was an explosion in a print factory and the result was a Webster's <laughs> Dictionary. But the point is that there's no doubt that Adam and Eve were uniquely created by God, which gives us our uniqueness. And what we must recognize is that there was a literal fall, a very literal fall, and the whole history of the human race has been written ever since. You know, you have the dysfunctional family right there, the consequences of sin. We could talk about the fall briefly. I think Adam and Eve had no idea what the implications of their disobedience would be. I can imagine them saying to each other, you know what we'll do? We'll eat the forbidden fruit, and then if we don't like it, we'll just go back to the garden and eat the other fruit. Mm. You know, and we'll go back to the way things were. Mm. Well, sin never allows you to go back to exactly the way things were. And so God drives them out of the garden, which was merciful, lest they eat of the fruit of the tree and live forever. And, uh, you know, there's no going back to paradise. But the good news is this, and I'm so glad I have the opportunity to share it, that where sin abounds now and you have the fall with all of the implications, what you also have now is grace. Mm. And Satan could not prevent God from displaying his grace. And when God gave them the coverings of skin, uh, and he must have killed animals to do it. God was saying right there, there's no cheap covering for sin. Sin is going to have to be covered, but blood is going to have to be shed. So for those who are listening and watching us today, Skip, whose hearts perhaps are really burdened with their sin, let them know that a covering has been prepared for them. It's not a cheap covering, but it is free to those who believe the gospel. And so that's it. So I think Adam and Eve, absolutely literal. Now, if you're asking the other question regarding the days, when you read the book of Genesis, it seems to me very clear that the intention is the author wants us to understand that these are 24-hour days. You know, the evening and the morning were the first day, and God rested on the seventh day, and, and all the way through the Sabbath was the seventh mm -hmm. day. And yet there are scientists today, Christian scientists, who really believe that the scientific evidence is so overwhelming that we cannot have a literal creation of seven days. And so I'm willing to hear them out because they know a lot more than I do about science. But if you read the Bible, you really get the impression here that we're talking about 24-hour periods. Bethel is one place I do understand because Bethel had already a rich spiritual history to it. 
Bethel was the place you will remember when Jacob was running from his house and he lay down at night and he slept and he saw this dream, this vision of a ladder going up to heaven, the angels of God coming down and going back up and he was so overtaken by it. The next day, he names the place Bethel, which means the house of God. It's a great experience. So Jeroboam thinks, instead of going to the house of God down in Jerusalem, we have the house of God here. This is the original Bethel, house of God. We have our own heritage. So he changes the object and the place of worship. Notice also he changes the means of worship. Verse 31, he made shrines on the high places and he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of of Levi. Well, that's forsaking God's word, right? Because God's word said there's only one tribe where the priests come from, and that's the tribe of Levi. But he goes, why? Why can't anybody be a priest? Why do you have to belong to the tribe of Levi? Why can't anyone who feels led to be a priest be a priest? Now, the day he said anybody can be a priest, you got to know that he made a lot of people happy who were going, yeah, why should the Levites have all the fun? Why, why do they get to hang out in the tabernacle in the temple? Whenever you lower the standard for those who lead worship, for those who do ministry, for those who serve the Lord in any capacity, when you lower the standard, you will have all the unqualified ones pouring in. He changes the means of worship. And finally, he changes the time of worship. Did you notice verse 32? He ordained a feast, watch this, on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah. And he offered sacrifices on the altar, so he did a Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month which he devised in his own heart. Why did he do this? Well, he's competing with the feast down south. The Feast of Tabernacles took place exactly one month prior, 7th month. So he goes, well, I'll do it the 8th month. Why? I feel led. It's in my heart. It's in my heart to do it. Now, on the surface, we go, what's wrong? One month is the same as another month, which is true unless God said, I want that month. So if God says, I want you to get together in October, and you go, no, I'll do it in November, you've just disobeyed God, right? So if God says, meet every week on the first day of the week to worship me, and you go, no, Christmas and Easter is good enough, you've just disobeyed God. He changed the times of worship. The only worship God accepts is the worship God directs. Do you recall that Jesus Christ said God the Father is actually looking for a certain kind of worshiper? Remember? He says the Father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So we want spirited worshipers who put truth or, or you know, the, the intensity of their own spirit into it. That's what it means but also in truth. And, and the way we know truth is by the revealed word of God. Jeroboam forsook the word of God and followed his own heart. And one always requires the other. There's a phrase in the Bible. If you read the Bible at all very much, you've seen this phrase about 80 times altogether. It's the phrase, it is written. It's one of Jesus' favorite phrases. When somebody comes to him or the devil attacks him at the temptation, he'll say, it is written. It is written. It is, Eighty times it is written. Now, I can only think that when God repeats something 80 times, it's pretty important to him. And why is that one so important to him? He must believe that what is written, what he has superintended and preserved in this book, that we had to take our cues from that for everything in life. And I've always loved Billy Graham, as you know. I came to faith by watching Billy Graham. One of Billy Graham's most famous phrases in all of his sermons is, the Bible says. He says, said that a lot. All of his great messages, and the Bible says, and boom, and the Bible says, and he'll quote it. 
And that's because there was a time in his life where he struggled with what the Bible says. And he was a young man wondering, should I, should I believe it all? Is it all God's truth and God's word? And when he finally came through that wrestling match and said, I'm going to declare your word as being truth, that's when he saw thousands of lives changed. Jeroboam made these four mistakes, and it led the nation to idolatry. Let me ask you a question. Do you think idolatry is just an Old Testament problem? Certainly not. As I mentioned, 1 John chapter 5, last verse of that book, John in the New Testament says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you will have no other gods besides me or before me. And John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Shows that it's a problem in every generation. Well, what is it exactly? What does idolatry mean? That you have a skip bobblehead? Is that idolatry? No, I don't, I don't think so. Idolatry means you place something in the place of God. That's what it means. That's the easiest way to think of it. Idolatry is letting anyone or anything occupy the supreme rightful place that only God should occupy as the one in charge of your life. And by the way, that can be inward. It doesn't have to be outward. You can want something. You may not have it, but you want it. You want a person. You want an object. Listen to Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He said, put to death your members which are on the earth like fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, listen to this, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. If you want a person or a thing more than you want God, it could be a girlfriend, it could be a boyfriend, it could be the approval of people, it could be a hobby, it could be a number of things, that can be idolatry. It always starts inwardly, but it always grows outwardly. So I want to close with two things. I want to ask you a personal question. I want you to ask yourself this question, and then I'm going to ask you to make a personal choice. Personal question, personal choice. Here's the personal question. What do you think about in quiet moments? Mull that around. What do you think about in quiet moments? What does your mind naturally, when left alone, gravitate to when you're all alone? Because your mind is a lot like a compass. You can take a compass and jostle it around and move it around, but when you set it down on a desk and you leave it to settle, that needle always points true north, one direction. And your mind can be occupied by a number of things during the day, like mine is, but when left to settle, what direction does it point to? Because the Bible says in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's who you are. What do you think about in quiet moments? That's the personal question. Now for a personal choice. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other, hold to one and repudiate the other. No man can serve two masters. Which one will it be? God or something else? Joshua said to the people, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some of you are thirsty. And I don't just mean physical thirst, like hurry up, finish the sermon so I can get a drink of water. That may be true as well, but I'm talking about that inward, nagging, unfulfilled vacuum that nothing or no one up to this point has ever been able to satisfy and quench. Some of you are thirsty. There is nothing or no one who will satisfy you like the love of God, the love of the sweet love of the living God. Are there any rivals in your heart? That's an idol. Is there a rival in your heart? That's why you're restless. Augustine said, we are restless, Lord, until we find our rest in thee. If there's a rival in your heart, that's what's causing the restlessness. We opened up speaking about American Idol. I suppose if there were ever an American Idol, the quintessential American Idol would be none other than Elvis Presley. 
I even had one person in first service say, amen, to that. And I was like, <laughs> okay, we have an Elvis fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm Elvis, I'm the king. But do you know that Elvis was interviewed by a reporter six weeks before he died? And the reporter said, Elvis, when you began your career, you said there's three things that you wanted in life. Number one, you wanted to be rich. Then you said you wanted to be famous. Then you said you wanted to be happy. Rich, famous, and happy. Elvis, are you happy? I know you're rich and famous. Are you happy? Without any hesitation, he said, no. I'm intensely lonely. The great Elvis Presley, the American Idol, intensely lonely, not happy. In fact, those who knew him and were close to him would often say that's the attribute that stuck out the most. He seemed so lonely. Are there rivals in your heart? Anyone competing for the love of God? Then choose this day whom you will serve. Because no one can serve two masters. From an earthly perspective, it can feel like this world continues to sink deeper into darkness and despair. You may feel like you don't see any light in humanity. True love seems like a thing of the past, and if you focus on what you see outwardly, you can come to a place of unrest. But when you experience God's love through His Son, Jesus Christ, darkness is dispelled. We want to ignite you with a new passion for God and love for others, shutting out the darkness that threatens your spirit and the world. That's why we'll send you Lenya Heitzig's study, Live Brilliantly, a study in 1 John, when you give a gift to support the ministry today. In only 20 minutes a day, this all-new Fresh Life Bible study will take you through the book of 1 John, inspiring you to respond to God's call to be light bearers in a dark world. Receive Live Brilliantly from Connect with Skip Heitzig when you give a gift to the ministry. Request your copy online or by phone 24 hours a day. 